Hey everybody, welcome back to this series on Curse of Strahd for Shadow Dark. This is part 5, and I'm going to be talking about what the players did last session, and then the prep I'm going to be doing for our next session on Monday, which is coming right up. It was another good session. Finally started to have some more action. I mean, last session we had a little bit of action. Um, it was limited to a couple characters. This time we had more uh, a sense of urgency. But it sort of developed over the course of the session, which I thought was really fun too. Things are starting to come. They're building up, building up, building up. They're starting to come to a head. And, uh, and I think next session it's going to blow up. Uh, at least I'm going to push for it to blow up because <laughs> I, I have some levers I can pull um, to make it blow up. So the players had been in the church. They had gotten the book that they needed in order to bury the Burgomaster. I, Ismark and Irina had refused to leave. Um, they really refused to do anything else until, well, Irina had, until the Burgomaster was buried. And so in order to do that, they needed the book of uh, Barovian prayers in order to bury him with the proper rituals and things because Ismark especially is pretty superstitious or religious in the in the Barovian way and so they needed that to happen and so the players went back into the church or rather into the church for the first time and they encountered lots of undead and horrifying things and they managed to get back there and got the, the, the book of prayers and they got out. So the players then um, went to the Blood of the Vine. They had these discussions. It was another session with a lot of discussion, especially at the start. It was sort of a slow build, slow burn. And the players were um, you know, discussing, what do we do? Uh, how do we move forward? And one of the players was thinking, you know, I really don't think we're going to benefit by going to the Vistani camp. It's just not going to help us. They're not going to tell us anything. Why would they? Um, so we need to convince Irina not to do it. This was Varya. Varya was like, we just need to convince Irina not to go to the Vistani. It's not going to help us. So they um, uh, they were hanging around for a bit. Um, Vanya uh, uh, from the Buildworth's Mercantile uh, is Periwimple in my game, but I changed his name to Vanya. Vanya came by and they asked him to go and dig the grave for them, and so he went back up to the grave and started to dig. Meanwhile, they were like, well, we need to go talk to the doctor because one of the bodies that was found in the church, a couple of the bodies that were found in the church, had been drained of blood the same way that Sorvia had. And so the... Uh, um, the priest character, Ulysses, was like, I'm going to go talk to, to Dr. Maxim. And he knocked on the door to Dr. Maxim's. Uh, he wasn't there. So they were like, well, hopefully he is somewhere. Hopefully he went to maybe Mary's house or something like that. And he and Varya, who had both gone over there, decided to investigate a little bit. So they went around the house looking in the windows. And one of the windows that they went past, Varya went past, was the surgery, and it was empty. There was no one in the surgery. That had been where... Um, that was the place where Ulysses had seen Sorvia's body. So it was like, okay, well, Sorvia, the, the sisters must have come and taken her body with them or something like that. Or maybe they buried her or burned her or something like that. Who knows? So they just they said, okay, well, they took care of the body. They kept going and they found Doru's room. Doru, who has been kind of been kept sedated, he's kind of been kept in there by, by uh, Maxim because um, he's been shocked and kind of terrified of what happened in the church. And so he's been trying to... Uh, recover there. And so they saw him sleeping there and uh, it looked like he'd been maybe drugged a little bit or something like that because he was breathing really quickly and shallowly. So like, okay, well, he's um, he's definitely nervous and still in that state. So then they left, they met again and they went back to the Blood of the Vine. They are like, well, Maxim wasn't there. Sorvia's body's gone. That's all been taken care of. Let's go to Mary's. So they went to Mary's and that's where Maxim was. And they started to talk to Maxim and it turns out that Mary had been also... Um, basically drained of blood. She wasn't dead yet, but she was very weak and she had the marks in her neck, the puncture marks. And the players were like, okay, definitely Gertruda. It's coming at night. She's draining her mother. She's a vampire. Um, although the characters are still kind of coming around to what the word vampire is. One of the players said it for the first time. Pavel, he like, when he was hearing all this, he's a vampire, you know, so he kind of, he knows what's going on. And I talked about how they know, you know, they can act on what they know from uh, folklore and stuff like that, what they know of vampires. The players know of vampires, and, and some of it will be true and some of it won't be true. Like, for example, garlic has no effect on vampires in this world. <laughs> um, the way that vampires die, uh, they aren't going to be wounded by running water. Um, that's not going to have any effect on them. Um, they need to be invited in, including uh, Strahd. All vampires need to be invited in. Places of public entry are open to them, and if they're ever invited in, they their invitation is is 
current until either the house is no longer someone's dwelling, in which case it becomes public or open or empty, or until their, their invitation is revoked, which is something that can do, the person who owns the house can revoke the invitation. So that is something that can happen. Uh, so that's, there are things like that which aren't traditional vampire folklore, but I'm adding into this world. So it's not going to be precisely what they all know, but there's going to be a, a set of rules that they can learn eventually about how to deal with these things because fighting them you know, face-to-face is not going to be uh, an easy prospect. Right? One of the ways you, of keeping them out, of course, is with holy symbols, and I'm going to have it be particularly... Um, they can't be destroyed by a holy symbol, but they can be turned, and when they turn, they'll flee because it causes them sort of, sort of pain. So that's the way that they're going to have to deal with Gertruda is going to be with presenting holy symbols and trying to turn undead. Um, and if they fail, then they're going to be in trouble. But if they succeed, then that kind of deals with that problem right there. Until they have better ways of dealing with vampires, that's you know, the best they can do is hold them off. Um, okay. Um, so uh, they went to Mary's. They found Maxim there. They found Mary was in the state. And they were like, okay, Maxim, this has now happened multiple times we've seen this wound before we saw it in the church you have to admit something else is going on and maxim was like i can't i can't i don't think they're no i can't and he seemed out of it so one of the players the priest was like oh man he's been charmed that's what this is and so he cast protection from good or protection from evil i should say <laughs> protection from evil which gives you a chance to save against any charm effects or possession and so i ruled that that would work here Gives you advantage on charm effects, and if you're possessed, it lets you make a save to try to expel the things. So it's sort of like an exorcism. And so I figured that would work with a vampire's charm, and it's one of their going to be one of their tools to deal with it, because otherwise it's a very powerful effect. It's just simply a very powerful effect. So being able to deal with the vampire's charm through this effect. It gives them an additional chance to save after they've been charmed. Um, you can attempt this over and over. So it's something that they can do. So he cast it on him, but he rolled like a two or a three. And then he rolled with a, he used one of his inspiration tokens, his luck tokens, and he rolled another like five or something like that. And he didn't cast the spell. Not only that, he lost it for the day. So protection from evil is gone until he rests, which is a huge deal, uh, especially for what's coming up. And so I described how Dr. Maxim's face like had this look of revulsion as the prayer first hit him, but then it, it faded quickly and he just kind of narrowed his eyes. It was like, hmm. And, because of course it didn't work. But it was an indication that it could have worked, that, 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 revolted reaction was a sign that there's something wrong there, but that he, uh, but that it didn't work. So the players were like, okay, he is definitely charmed. We need to deal with this. It would have been great to have him uncharmed. He would have been a great ally to have. Um, but for now, we can't really trust him. So they, uh, they kept an eye on him. They said, let's go to see Ismark and Irina. They went, the play, a couple of players stayed behind and talked to Mary and, and asked her how she was doing. And she was sensitive to light and she was um, very tired and she kept, um, kind of mumbling about things that weren't really happening. And so they were like, okay, should we need to help her? She's, she's on the brink. And they don't know whether she's going to just die and become a vampire or if it's, like a, if it's like a disease that affects you and slowly you turn into one or if you have to be killed by it. They don't know that. And so they're, they're in doubt about what to do about Mary. They, they know that they can't leave her alone or else she'll die and they're right about that. Um, but they don't know what to do. The doctor insists she can't be moved, but they're like, well, that probably is just to leave her in the house where she's a open to being attacked because they know that there's this idea of invitation. So what if we bring everybody to the blood of the vine and we remove all the signs of invitation? Well, the problem is it's already been, it's an open house. It's not theirs and it has been opened up to anyone. And so in that sense, it, anyone can enter, including vampires. It's, it's an open invitation. So they would have to, what they really would have to do was have um, the sisters, Alenka and uh, Mirabelle, revoke invitation to every anyone that's what they would have to do in order for the vampires to not be able to do it. but so they're thinking about that they're also thinking about the burgomaster's mansion which if they do the burgomaster's mansion then gertruda cannot enter unless she charms someone into inviting her in. really if she charms ismark or irena into inviting her in um, and ismark as burgomaster has the authority to invite anyone into any building in the town because he has the authority over the town that's how i'm going to be ruling it is that the rulers are especially important for the vampires to take control of because then they can invite them into any place because they have that authority um, so Ismark is an important person to not kill for the vampires. They want him intact, and they want him to be able to invite. Um, so Ismark is going to be a, a, a character for them to, to keep alive. Um, or at least for Gertruda once, once she kind of figure out, figures out what's going on. So um, they went to Ismark and Irina. Dr. Maxim was there. They talked to them about their plan. They, they went and buried the Burgomaster. It was a very touching scene. It was raining slightly 
uh, they, they buried him, the Ice Mark and Irina were there, and then they all decided to go back to the tavern for a little bit of a wake. And so they were drinking and they were talking and sort of enjoying themselves for a moment. And uh, the players mentioned casually, basically, uh, that the sisters had taken Sorvia's body with them. And Ismark said, no, they didn't. I saw them leave. They just left. And the players went, wait, you mean they, they didn't take her body with them? But her body's gone. And, and Ms. Mark was like, I don't know. I mean, maybe they buried her already or something like that. And they freaked out and they ran over to Dr. Maxim's. And they were like, doctor, show us where her body is. And they, he took them to the surgery, and it wasn't there, of course. And he was like, I don't understand. And, of course, they're like, you've been charmed. You're, you know, you're not it. You're not totally with it. So they searched desperately all around. And a couple of the players went to Doru, and they were like, tell us what's going on. Help, you know, what's going on here? Who are you? Know, who are you? Did you hear anything? All that stuff. And so Doru started to talk to them about what he knew and what he feared. And he's like, my father is one of these things. I, I saw Gertruda. She's the one along with the, these people in robes. They attacked the church while we were all in there. Uh, she killed my father. But I saw my father last night outside my window. He's, he's, he's back. He's, he's whatever she is. I know. And, you know he, basically, he was raving, but he was right. And they were like, you know, you have a choice. Do you want to lay here and moan or do you want to help us fight? And he was like, I want to help you. And so they, they recruited him as, like a, as an NPC. And so I gave him uh, the acolyte stat block because he's his father's... Um, Son, so over here on the staff block, you see that he is a, uh, a religious trainee. And he can do healing touch, and he has a little attack, 12 AC, 4 hit points. So he's a real weak, but he has healing touch, so it means he can heal them up in combat, and he's got this. So he's a little, you know, it's, it's something. It's, they got something. They got an NPC uh, joining them around. So then they were hunting around for where Sorby could be, and behind Dr. Maxim's is it's his own private well that goes down to the cistern. Now there's the market well. The one that was uh, most people use, but then there's Dr. Maxim's private well. And they were like, oh no. And they found that there was mud tracked in from outside into the house. So someone had gone out to the well and back into the house. And they're like, okay, so she's down there, isn't she? So they lowered Arthur down the thief. They lowered him down with a rope or a chain or something like that. And he found himself in this big cistern that opened up underneath the town. So I actually was glad that I had the map prepared because I at least had something to describe. And so he goes down into the cistern and he sees her body like tossed down there. They threw her down the well or someone threw her down the well. Um, and they're pretty sure it's Dr. Maxim. And they haven't checked him. If they check him, they'll see his boots are muddy in the same way with like the a special clay that's right around the well or something. So they'll see, oh yeah, okay, he's, he's obviously the, the one that did this. But they're already suspicious of it. So they found her body down there, and they, they were like, okay, she's fallen you know, 30 feet down into this well, smacked into the side, smacked into the stone at the bottom of the well. Um, she's very clearly dead, but she's already dead. But she should be more broken up than she is. And her body didn't look like it was all that damaged by the fall, and so they brought her back up into the sunlight. And this was where I kind of messed up, because really she's turning, well, maybe I could, I'll hit this, she was turning into a vampire. She wasn't yet one. This whole bit here I was caught up in. I was trying to kind of think on my feet because I hadn't expected them to put all of this together or to act on it so quickly, but they did. They were like, we're going to go down to that well, we're going to get her. And then they grabbed her body and dragged it back up into the light. And so really what I should have had happen is I should have had the light start to burn her, sizzle her. But I didn't do that. She just brought her up and she looked like she was pretty good. Aside from being very pale, she looked healthier than she had before when they saw her body. Now, in my mind, she's turning into a vampire, and that doesn't occur until uh, nightfall. And it's still like 2 in the afternoon, so she still has hours for this process to occur. So maybe that's how I'll explain why this wasn't fully set yet. But she didn't burn in the sunlight, and she should have, because that's one of the things that vampires do is they burn in the sunlight. Okay, so um, uh, Pavel took his... Um, steak, because he had been whittling a steak. Once he said that word vampire early in the session, he was like, okay, I, I, you know, I'm going to start making a steak, because I know that wood in this old story, is, well, a steak of wood is what kills these things. So he was, was you know, whittling it, and he stabs it. He uses his hammer to smack it into her chest. And I described how her eyes open, and she shrieks with this loud shriek that echoes around uh, the field and against the house and this horrifying wail. And then I described how she, uh, after a couple more of these strikes, she... Uh, falls back and her skin begins to tighten and it begins to like decay really rapidly. Now this is again, I wanted to kind of create a horrific image, but I also didn't want it to be um, just like she wails and then she falls back down. So I described it as she kind of desiccates into this old long dead corpse and it just starts to become more and more decayed. And one of the characters 
cut off the head. He used his long sword to like wipe off her head. And it was like kind of like a, a skeletal head by the time it fell off with a little bit of decayed flesh and, and hair and stuff like that. So it was this rapid decay and, and the players were confused by that. A couple of, one of my players was like, I, that doesn't make any sense to me. Now, she wasn't saying it as a criticism. I think she was saying it genuinely as, oh, I thought it was going to be one thing and it's not, so I'm confused now about what was really going on. I think that's what she meant. But I felt it a little bit as a criticism and I, and I felt it inside of me as a criticism because I agreed with it, that it didn't make sense. Really, what should have happened is she should have, uh, Sorvia should have dusted, right? As they say in Buffy, the vampire says she should have turned to dust. Or she should have gone back to looking like she did before. That would have been better, right? That would have been more... Um, more in kind, because that's how it had the other undead die, was they had to come back to looking at their, as their things. So I, I, I actually might do something which I, I shouldn't do, which is I might message them and say, hey guys, by the way, I was wrong in my description of her death. She doesn't decay in this old way. She just goes back to looking like she did before or when she was dead. She goes back to looking ordinary and dead. I might describe it that way. Because I do want that to be the way. It's, it's they're going back. Because in this world, I'm thinking of it more as almost like a possession thing rather than like a, they're an undead. Um, their body's dead, but they are now this sort of other thing. There's the spirit in them, and that's how the protection from evil works against them. And I'm kind of thinking of it that way. And so um, really, it shouldn't happen like this. It really shouldn't happen like this. So um, I, I think I'm going to go in and message them that way. Regardless, they stood up from this thing that they had done, and they were like, whew all right, we need to get out of here. We need to go and figure out what to do next. And they went back to the house. And that was it. That was the whole session. So um, very exciting, especially towards the end there. There was that definite tension as they lowered Arthur down into the well. When they found the body down, they, they, all of their suspicions had been confirmed. And when they brought her back up, they were like, we need to try this to see if this will work. And it worked. And they were like, okay, now we at least kind of know how to deal with these vampires is to use these stakes. And, and, and uh, yeah, that'll, that'll be something. They know that flowing water didn't seem to work because they described how she was half laying in the flowing water. And they were like, well, that, according to what we know, that should have burned her like acid, but it didn't. So, you know, again, because water, flowing water doesn't affect vampires in, um, in uh, Shadow Dark, at least as far as I can tell. There's nothing in their stat block that talks about flowing water. So I, I haven't included that in this. There's direct sunlight, and that's what should have happened here. Um, and... Uh, um, they can't be killed unless they're so. So one way I could have said that was that you know sunlight doesn't kill them; they just take damage. But they can't die unless they're staked at zero hit points. So maybe that's what it was. She was at zero hit points. The sunlight can't damage her anymore. But then she was staked. So maybe that's what I'll, I'll be describing. Anyway, that was last session. It was excellent. It was super fun. We only played for like two and a half hours or so. That's basically been our MO. Each session is about two and a half hours because we're playing on Monday night. We all have work, or most of us have work the next day. So it's it's kind of hard to um, play too late. Um, and then we also usually talk for like half an hour, 45 minutes afterwards to hang out. So it's a, it's a great, it's a great uh, routine, but it does mean our sessions are a little short. Okay, so what I'm going to be doing for today is preparing for our next session. Now, I've had these events already written out. Um, and again, these things are, are, are all wrong, basically. That day, they already left. They didn't burn Sorvia's body. I decided to do this other thing with it where the, they, they left without her tip burning her body. They wanted to get out of there and Dr. Maxim to protect her from the sunlight, threw her down the well um, because that was all he could do quickly because he wanted to get her out of there because Maxim, again, has been enchanted to help the, or charmed to help the, the cult. And then Eric already left, so I'm going to erase that as well. So that day, nothing else is going to happen, really. Um, that day is, is pretty much it. Um, the characters, oops. The players will plan and execute their, well, we'll plan and execute their plan. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Probably involving gathering the townsfolk somewhere safe. They mentioned talking to Bildreth as well. All right. So they went. They wanted to go talk to Bildreth and Vanya. Probably gathering the townsfolk somewhere safe. I don't put that in quotation marks. All right. So that night, Irina is attacked again. Uh, Mary is killed by Gertrude. Her father Donovich feeds on Doru. So none of that happened because Doru was with them. So I'm going to uh, eliminate that. Um, the next night, um, the cult. Oops. I can once again. The, the cult 
led by or cult members. Cult members led by Gertruda seek out Sorvia and her killers. They attempt to slay the players, capture Irina and Ismark, and take the book from Varya. That's what they're doing. So what I have to then prepare, um, uh, delete this because that is, is, well, no, I can keep that. Um, well, no, because because that's it's going to be totally different, Irina. If the players are all dead, and Irina gets taken, well, because I guess they might be able to take her and run in the in the chaos. So, um, yeah, so that'll happen. Yeah, that'll all happen. Eric Phil's returns with Tamara's left unpacked and empty. That's all true. Vanya finds Mary dead. That's probably not going to happen. It could happen. I'll, I suppose I'll leave it still there because they might not leave Mary. Um, no, that's not there. It tells Vanya finds Mary dead. Yeah, that's it. Then the final night, we marry rises a pharaoh vampire, the ghost, the graveyard, the dead, and the church attack, and the wolves attack as well. Dr. Maxwell has been a charm by Gertrude and follows her back to Ravenloft. Doru was killed as most of but Doru, um, the townsfolk who remain. That's what I'll say. The townsfolk who remain are killed or scatter into the woods. Or scatter into the woods. Let's use capture turn into the werewolf and prison. Okay, so that's all that's all done. But this thing right here, cult members the next night. Or I should say that night. So this is the big thing that's gonna happen, and it'll be the big set piece battle of them staying as long as they have. Now, if they just leave, then that's done. I have the travel plans kind of coming up. I already know that. But if they if they don't leave, then this is what's gonna happen. So this is what I need to prepare. So I'm gonna go down here and I will say the cults attack. And I will bolt it and center it. And then um, this is going to be their uh, description. Okay, so this is where it gets a little tricky because I know if they do gather everybody, then it's going to be Vanya and uh, Bildrith and Ismark and Dr. Maxim, although Dr. Maxim won't be trusted necessarily, trustworthy, uh, and Doru, and then the four players at least, along with any other townsfolk that they can gather. So it could be a big attack, and I might just have it be described as a big attack on the town anyway. I might move things back a night, basically, um, and just have lots of people attacking uh, the cult, at least large members of the cult. So I got to have a couple stat blocks that I am aware of. And I think... Um, it would be simple enough to do something like a couple bandits. Um, they're hit point four, so they're fairly easy to kill. They get an extra two and extra dive damage if they do that, but they're just a small, easy stat block of humans to have out there. Um, so it might have some bandits, maybe a berserker. Uh, you could have a cultist. They're stronger. You notice the cultists are much stronger in this. And they have death touch, which is 2d4 damage, which is really high, and they're immune to morale checks. They have a long sword, uh, plus one, or a spell plus two. Uh, and they have AC 4, 2, and 9 hit points. So cultists are a little bit tougher. So I could do cultists. Um, so um, a cultist, 9. Um, 9 hit points means unless they get a crit, he's not dying in one hit. Um, with AC 14, they're probably not going to hit him twice in a turn on average. The cultist, this guy's name is um, um, Alexei... Um, Makarov. Makarov. Leads an expedition to the town to seize the book. Irina. And to destroy those who have slain. Sorvia. Um, they come from the town uh, from Ravenloft itself. 
where Rahadin continues his ritual to return Strahd to the living. All right, so who else is coming with him? Well, I think we're going to do... These are level one, no level two characters now. So they have a few more hit points, and they haven't really been pushed yet in a combat. So I think this could be a big set piece combat. But we're already going to have Gertruda and Father Donovich as vampires running through the town. Like, that's super deadly. So we already have two vampires one vampire and a vampire spawn. Vampire Gertruda and vampire spawn. Father Donovich. Neither of whom can enter the Virgo Master's mansion. So maybe they'll be standing outside. Ooh, that would be super creepy. Yeah. Creepy image. Gertruda standing innocently by the front fence in her sheer nightgown blood stained uh, blood stained and Father Donovich crawling and hissing about at her So they're standing by the front fence staring while the rest of the thing is attacked by cultists and things like that. Then we have 2d4 uh, bandits. Is that the way to go with staff lock? Uh, we have bandits, we have guards, we have peasants, reavers, soldiers, thieves, thugs. Probably thugs. Thugs have... Um, they're, they're basically exactly thieves, they just have weaker stats, leather and shield. So 2d4 thugs attack wherever the players are. And then of course, there's a werewolf. Luvash number 69, oh yeah, so 2d4 thugs, which is number 40. Yeah, so we have Luvash number 69, um, and, uh, sorry, distracted here. Luvash number 69 as a werewolf, um, breaks in with the sole intention of taking Irina. He, yeah, so that's that, and yeah, that's his whole point. Okay. Um, so then we have the vampire and the vampire spawn, number 80. And vampire spawn, Father Donovich, number 81. So that's the whole point. Uh, occultist, 2d4 thugs. Um, with one half with crossbows yeah old crossbows antique crossbows because they're from the castle antique crossbows attack wherever the players are um, waves if the players deal with them too quickly so, again, if they just like, oh, this is easy, then I can throw in more. But 2d4 seems like a good solid um, number to come down. Uh, I would say, we'll say, let's just say seven. Or six thugs. Because we have six thugs, Luvash, Occultus. That's eight people coming down plus, yeah, that's the way to go. Six thugs, uh, half with Antichrist, with three guys with crossbows, three guys with swords, and then the other three guys with daggers. Uh, attack where the players are. Waves the players deal with them too quickly. Sounds all good. All right, so that's the cult, um, the cult's attack. Pretty straightforward. 
Um, but it'll introduce some things. It'll introduce the idea of the cult, and it'll introduce the idea that they are um, being attacked. So that's what's going to happen that night. So again, this will be sort of a, a combat, a, um, a, a hard one, and one that they have to be very careful about how they approach. Like if they're outside, then they're going to deal with a vampire and a vampire spawn. Luvash is there as a, as a werewolf. They can't kill him, but his whole point is to take Irina. So they can try to stop him. They can shoot him. That won't work. I mean, they can use fire to scare him off or to hurt him. Fire will damage him. But um, if they just shoot him or smack him, then that's it. But fortunately, he's a werewolf, and I think that will mean Pavel will attack him, and Pavel won't be able to do anything until he's in his beast form, and then his bite will do damage. So Pavel's beast will have probably have, hope, may, might have a really cool fight, and if we don't, Lubash isn't interested in killing the players, so if he knocks them out, he doesn't kill them. If he knocks the players out, he doesn't kill them, but keeps going to get Irina. Um, so, I gotta do some stat blocks real quick for the players. And what players do we have? Well, we have, um, we already know that Doru, Doru is an acolyte, number 23. We have Fanya is, uh, he should be a gladiator or a berserker. He's a berserker. Yeah. Banya is a Berserker, number 28. Um, and then we have Ismark, is a what? Um, he could be a guard, he's not a knight, he's not a peasant, he's not a reaver. We could make him a, a, a soldier, we could make him a thug. But I think we should make him a soldier with, with 13 AC. Soldier uh, number 38. Irina is a thief, I think. Yeah. Um, we do a guard. They're basically the same stat block. Um, yeah, Irina is a thief. Number 39. And, and that's what they're going to have with you. Dr. Maxim is a peasant, but he's he's out of it. Um, and any other townsfolk are going to be peasants. Any other townsfolk are peasants. Uh, number 35. Okay. So if they manage to gather an army, that'll be it. And if they do gather an army, then I will add a whole bunch more thugs. Adjust if there are more townsfolk to fight. All right. Well, I think that's it. Um, or rather than adjusting to have more townsfolk to fight, the fight will have vampire and vampire spawn break in. Yeah. And then the players will just watch as the townsfolk are slaughtered by these things. And they can't really stop them. That's the danger, except by turning them. That's the only way to stop them. Um, but they are here for the book. They are here to see who killed Sorbia. And they are here to maybe report back. Yeah. Report back. OK. Why aren't they killing them? That's a good question. Take their measure? Well, we'll see. Anyway, this is what I have. And again, I'll adjust it as I go, but I, I know a basic idea. You're gonna have two very dangerous things outside if they just hang around and wait for them. Two very dangerous things outside. One very dangerous thing that can break in, and then a bunch of guys who are also trying to break in with the cultist who is there as well. Okay, awesome. Well, I'm gonna save that, and uh, that should, um, I'll do this. That should be sufficient. All right, guys, hope this has been interesting. I'll let you know how the session goes uh, in another video. Bye-bye.